at some point, all of us will have to make this huge financial commitment and that's buying a home. Now with property prices reaching new highs in recent years in Singapore, does it still pay off to, to plan ahead and to buy a government flat when you're still young? Let's bring in um, Karine, you had a question on this. Um, I'm Kareen and I'm currently a year two uh, SMU student. So, um, you know, uh, with around uh, me, um, actually a lot of my peers are actually looking for BTO or currently applying for BTO. So, um, for me, uh, actually I do not feel a sense of urgency in getting a flat or... So, it, um, I have this question whether, um, you know, how early is it to start planning or to start saving up for your first house? Yeah. I think that it's never too early to start saving. I wish that I was taught this because I only started saving at like maybe 30, so <laughs> very horrible. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, so it's never too early and it's amazing that people at the early 20s or mid 20s really start planning. And obviously I wish that for everyone. Now, whether you get a BTO, a, a government house or not, really depends on whether you have a partner to buy it with, right? If not, you've got to buy a government house at 35. So let's start with the question that everyone, every professional will ask, right? Why? You want to get a house to stay? Why? Family, partner, spouse, or mental health away from my parents, or I like in being introvert in my own man cave or woman cave, you know, why? And then from why, then you identify the needs and then the wants. So if you really need to move out, then identify how you can move out. And then if you earn enough, then save, like do something what we call reverse affordability. So I, need, I really need to buy, okay, let's start smaller, lah. don't buy a two million condominium, right? So a resale, if I'm 35 or if I'm not 35, um, a private 900,000 one bedroom, small, 500 square feet. <laughs> okay, whatever, right? Then I need to know, I need to save, <laughs> 200,000 and I need to earn 4,500 then I can get the loan etc right so all these factors are in there you anchor your purchase to the finance and if you're not there yet you work towards it so now your life has purpose has goal and it stems from the why not the I want because wants are frivolous wants change all the time hi uh, I'm Darius thank you all for coming and sharing with us I'm a sophomore at SMU and I work part-time in a bar so my question, or I would say the context behind my question would be many students and young adults are planning their future and first thing, the major thing that you will buy is your home. So my question would be, is it better at this current market to rent a house or to buy a house at this current market and what are the benefits or cons would you say in this uh, environment now? Yeah. It is never a good decision to rent a place if you can, if you can buy a place because uh, what we, we say very logically is when you rent a place, you are paying the landlord's mortgage for, his debt, for him or her, right? Um, however, again, go to the why. If you need to move out no matter what, then rent is no choice. Lah. Then you work your budgets behind it. But if you could afford to buy, again, plan towards it and get a place for yourself. And there are other ways, like if it's not a HGB, it's a government house, is a private house, you can buy two bedrooms and rent out one bedroom to cover costs, right? There are many other ways to do things not just I buy, I pay. I buy, I pay, I have tenant. What are these other ways? Share with us. If you work for five years, earning a median income of about 4,000. That's a lot. Lah. Okay, so 2,000. You also have 25,000 in your CPF by now as part-timer. Well, find a like-minded individual who needs to move out. You have 50K plus savings 50K. You have 100K, right? You buy a 700K, 800K house, very small. One sleep in the living room, need base is need base, like, you know. But you, you can achieve things if you really need and want to. And everybody actually is more resilient than, than we, we think we are. I just want to chip in to give a slightly different perspective. You should definitely buy your HDB. But if you're thinking about buying a private condominium, you might want to do your math. If you want to buy a private condominium and if you rent a private condominium, uh, you avoid paying that huge down payment but you have to invest that down payment that you didn't put in. You avoid buying that mortgage insurance, so you have to invest that premium that you didn't buy. And if you don't pay the sinking fund, you can invest that as well. So sometimes it's not just a financial decision. 
It is also where you can call a home, where you can build your family. Uh, neighbors are important. You don't want to keep changing neighbors every two years or every four years, right? So that's the financial aspect. You may want to do your numbers, but even if the number the numbers worked out well, consider the non-financial one because the non-financial ones might many times be more important than the financial ones. I'd love to add another point. Um, with making decisions like this can be emotional and a major decision looking ahead is that it has to be a near a school of your choice for your future children. Um, and there are individuals who will rent for that period of time um, before they can buy anything because if it's listed that they're a homeowner, they don't qualify for that area of schooling. So again, something to consider because if you plan to have children, it's one of the most major life-changing decisions ever. Hi, I'm Joshua Chow. I'm 26 this year, a student at the Singapore Management University. And I have a question about the housing market in Singapore. So as a Singaporean and an individual who is probably looking to give a shot at the BTO process and someone who is start looking forward to starting a family after I have established my career, how should my future partner and I um, approach the issue of whether or not we should purchase a bigger flat given the appreciation in property prices as we have seen recently. It really depends again on needs and wants and setting the goals. A three-room flat, a four-room flat or a five-room flat, it is easier to sell and properties will appreciate more when it's a family unit buying it. And family units do not buy normally unless they are of lower income, a three-room flat. They will buy a four-room or a five-room flat with three bedrooms minimally for their children and themselves. And that's why the prices increase better. So if you want and you have a budget, try to budget minimally a four-room flat or a five-room flat. And also near schools. Primary schools are more important than secondary schools. Uh. And then of course amenities like MRT, bus interchange and stuff like that. So you find that good primary school, you get a school near it, your house value won't drop tremendously during bad times and will definitely increase more during good times. And if you do well, and you can buy another house in the future as an investment property. You can stay in the private house and rent out the, the government housing because people want to rent to get into the school as well. So it's, it's good decisions all the way from the very beginning. Hi, I'm Yan Jie. I'm 27 this year and I work in communications. So I just selected my BTO flat last year and it's going to be completed in about four years. So now I'm trying to save up, save up for my renovation and wedding costs. And I'm wondering where should I put these funds in so that it's earning the interest rate that will benefit me in the future. I would say four years is not enough time for you to put 100% of your money into the equities market. It's too risky, right? Because you don't have time to ride out the volatilities of the market. So if you still want to participate in the growth of the equities market, I would suggest that you put into a portfolio 80% bonds, global bonds, investment grade bonds, and 20% global equities. So for the bonds part, you can again uh, very simply get an exchange traded fund. I'm always talking about ETF because it's a very simple way to get exposed to the market at a very low cost. So for the bonds portion, you can buy an ETF that tracks the global investment uh, grade bond market. And for the equities, as I mentioned, you can easily use an ETF to track the all country world index, right? So that's that will uh, be okay if it's four years. But if you don't like this risk, you don't like the volatility, and at four years, uh, when the four years is up, you really need the money, then you can consider a few other things. You can buy, for now, maybe a short-term single premium endowment from the insurance companies. Uh, right now, it's anything between 3.5 to 3.7% uh, for a two-year to a three-year single premium endowment. You can consider putting it into a, a SGS bonds, the Singapore Government Securities bonds. A two-year to maturity SGS bonds, current yield is probably about 3.5%. It's not that bad, right? Two years, it will mature. Of course, the downside is that after it mature, you've got to find some place to park it again for another two years, right? Uh, or if you don't want to, you can buy the Singapore Savings Bond. So consider some of these investments uh, whereby it is liquid and you can take out the money anytime. Yeah. Now, if you have more questions about adulting in Singapore, get in touch with us at this address. We'd love to hear from you.